Good morning, everyone. Luke Marland, Chief Counsel of the General Assembly. Good morning. I'm here today on page 688. And if you remember, last time we walked through this bill at a high level, and then we talked about the cause of action section. And if you remember, there was really two parts of the cause of action section. One part, which was subsection A, and I called it scenario A, was what we called a writ of mandamus, or Article 75. Uh, action based on the failure of A&R to take any action to promulgate rules. And then the other section was B, and I called it scenario B, which was that A&R did promulgate rules, but they weren't having the desired effect. They weren't achieving the greenhouse gas reduction requirements that was in another part of that same bill. There was some discussion about what would happen if such a case was brought, and the judge found that indeed the rules were not having the desired impact, what would be the recourse? And the judge would send it back to a &R and tell a &R to develop better rules or redo the rules. And that led to a discussion, I believe, well, could the judge dictate specifically what the rules would contain? So I think you had that discussion with the Attorney General's office. They submitted a memo to you. This is the memo that was submitted to you, and on page four, you'll see this paragraph that begins with however, that is shown on the screen. And what they were suggesting is a couple of word changes. And so this shows the bill that you looked at and their suggested changes. They suggested adding the word remanding, the words remanding the matter. And remand is what an appellate court does to send a matter back to a lower court. So it's basically sending back. So remanding the matter. And then in the end, they suggested adding consistent with this act. And so this language was also submitted to and run by the House Energy Committee. And I believe what House Energy will do is adopt these changes and insert the phrase remanding the matter. And also insert at the end consistent with, let's say, chapter instead of act. It has the same impact, just how we phrase things. So a couple of word changes to this part of that bill to achieve the effect of making it clear that the judge would send the matter back to a &R to improve the rules or develop new rules and that they would do so consistent with the rest of the law. And I'm looking at the, the bill that's introduced where this would be. It's be on page 20, Madam Chair. Yep. Section 4, I'm sorry, 594, cause of action. At the bottom is B, lines 20 and 21. Okay. And if you flip over to the next page, yep. there would be 3, which starts on line 12. That's the subsection that would be modified. Mark. Could you define the term remanding versus directing? How that makes a difference? I don't know if it makes a huge difference. I think remand is, as I said, common sort of colloquial terms. It's to send back to a lower court is how it's normally used. So this would make perhaps it clear that the judge would send the matter back to A and R to develop new rules as opposed to directing, which maybe had the implication of providing the judge the ability to be very, very specific in what those rules should contain, which is, I think, the issue you were trying to avoid. So um, possible scenario, uh, community group uh, feels that uh, the agency did not um, follow through on certain aspects of the charge. Um, the community could bring uh, action forward. Yes, under the word used as person, yes. which is quite broad, yes. so it could be an individual, an organization mm -hmm. could sue. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, we hope that isn't the case, but you know, I mean, strange things happen in Malta here. Just a, another question that maybe we covered the other day, but just want to make sure. Um, so if the agency, they're on time, they do the rules, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there can be a challenge of the rules on their face, presumably whether it was arbitrary and capricious. I didn't know we talked about that. But what if they are not, in fact, enforcing the rules? Is there a cause of action that can be brought in that instance? Interesting question. I don't know if we talk about that. Maybe under 
uh, under existing law, that'd be similar to the writ of mandamus. It'd be a governmental entity that's not carrying out a lawful duty it should be carrying out, not enforcing the rules. Maybe you could do that. That'd be under uh, Rule 75. Or under this bill, if it's kept similar to the language we currently have, under uh, subsection A, perhaps they could take action under that. Um, just to be clear, there's nothing in the current bill that allows a &R to impose a fee or a fine, so I don't know quite how they would be enforcing it. They don't have an enforcement mechanism in the current language of the bill. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Superior Judge uh, speaking to H668, 688, I'm sorry, and I would uh, direct my comments to section 594, uh, page 20 of the bill, uh, section 594, cause of action, um, and, and just remind the committee that we don't speak uh, to policy with respect to the bill as a whole. Uh, my comments uh, would be limited to 594 and any impact it may have on the court. Um, in um, brief terms, um, when I was notified that I was asked to testify, I did uh, review uh, the PowerPoint that was presented to this committee uh, last week by um, Mr. Marlin. I did also, he provided me with a copy of the memorandum from the AG's office, so I have seen that. Um, and I. Uh, canvassed, if you will, the judges who normally sit in the civil court uh, or civil division uh, to get their sense of any impact this might have. And I would say that the um, certainly the majority of the responses, if not all of them, were that they did not see that if the bill was enacted the way it was, that it would have a significant impact on the court's uh, workload or procedures, so we don't see any uh, impact in that respect. Um, I was trying to uh, determine from review of, of uh, Mr. Marlon's comments as well as the AG's office what the issues the committee might be asking. Um, I, w I was struck in, in looking at the, the bill I noticed in uh, one of the PowerPoints, uh, one of the questions I think raised last week was, was 594 necessary um, in light of the fact that Rule 75 is already in existence and uh, there is a significant amount of case law that has been built up over the years around uh, that rule. So I think the committee, um, it would be worth the committee considering whether or not any uh, change, any addition is necessary. I would then point out, uh, particularly as it relates to Section B, uh, that is the scenario when a rule has been adopted um, and the claim by the individual or community uh, that the rule adopted by the secretary has failed to achieve the emissions reduction requirements pursuant to another section. If you look at section three, there are a couple of terms in there that I think will be, quite frankly, the source. If there's going to be litigation, it, that will be the source of the litigation. Uh, the terms are essentially undefined, uh, and I'm referring specifically, if you, beginning on line 12 on page 21 of the. I'm looking at uh, bill as introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, if the court finds its rules adopted by the secretary pursuant to section 593 are a substantial cause of failure to achieve the emissions. Uh, there is no definition of substantial cause. Um, and reading along, uh, if the court finds that's the case, if the court finds the secretary is taking prompt and effective action, um, again, those are essentially un undefined terms. I'm not suggesting that the committee needs to define those, but I will tell you that that would 
at least appear to myself and the other judges who reviewed this, that that will probably be the source of, of the litigation. Um, and, and as a practical matter, that's what we do. So it's not that the, there's a burden on us, but I just want to alert the committee that if passed in this form, I can see that as an area that will cause a substantial to the extent there's litigation, I can see that it could focus on those areas because they are undefined and because they're relatively new uh, as opposed to the case law that's been built up around uh, Rule 75 litigation. And then when you get into the subsection C, it talks about a prevailing party or substantially prevailing party. Again, those terms um, are familiar to, to the court process. They are essentially determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so a, a simple question is that if uh, the court says that the secretary um, needs to take prompt and effective action and gives them a reasonable time to do so, the question may be asked, does that mean that the plaintiff has prevailed um, by virtue of the fact that you're now giving the secretary more time, or is that substantial prevailing? And again, that that would be an area that I expect would be the subject of litigation. So I, I don't think, uh, I'm glad to answer or try to answer questions of the committee, but essentially we do not see an impact. Um, but those are the areas I can see if it's enacted uh, that would lead to areas of, of litigation. And so that's why the committee may want to consider whether uh, they need this section as opposed to the existing one. Okay. Thank you. Matt, yes, thank you. So, Judge, um, I wanted to go back to the, the, the undefined terms. Yes. Um, and and how uh, they're undefined. I, I'm, I'm sort of hesitant to have the legislature define them because I think that's, you know, obviously a little bit more of a case by case type thing. Uh, is this something that Perhaps if we want to make sure that the legislature's intent is followed to a degree, that maybe some guidelines for what that means would be helpful, or is that more problematic? I, I don't want to say it's more problematic, but if you remember my testimony from yesterday from a completely different bill, every time you try to define something, it's going to lead to further. Right. So. I, I think if you try to define substantial cause, obviously the court will attempt to follow the legislature's intent. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. But it will still be subject to interpretations by both both sides, and the court will then have to determine, um, mm -hmm. come up with a decision around that phrase. Um, okay. So I'm not suggesting the, the uh, there might be room for, for guidance, but again, I think it's still going to be litigated. Right, regardless. I mean, that's that's my sense. And if they and if the court made a decision that we didn't or if, if, if we found that the court was consistently interpreting in a way that the legislature didn't like, we could have never well, exactly that. And you'd interpret it in a different way. Uh, yes, that's uh, pretty much the way it would work. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. A uh, couple questions. Um, so if we didn't have this provision in there, if we didn't, well, if we didn't include uh, B, um, and the, an inventory comes out, uh, the, the greenhouse gas inventory comes out in, let's say, 2026, uh, and it shows that the agency has not met the target, what kind of, what kind of guidance would the court have if somebody tried to bring a lawsuit in that scenario? If B did not exist, right. the remedy, I think, is, as Mr. Brown pointed out, would be uh, through Rule 75. Uh, in other words, correcting them, asking them to uh, take. But if, but if, um, if the if the law just simply provided that uh, the A&R need to come up with rules and they have to meet this target, and they didn't meet that target. Uh, Trying to find the question here. The, the concept, I think, of having substantial in here is to explain that while well, it's not entirely ANR's obligation, you know, if, if the legislature hasn't 
followed up on its component of it, uh, for instance, uh, that would provide something to look at for whether the NR rules uh, were a substantial cause of the failure. And, and that's the guidance that they were trying to give to the court. Uh, and absent that, it would seem that that's you know, that the court is left. It's more it's more wide open. It's broader as far as what can be argued by plaintiffs. I don't know if you have a comment on that. I'm trying I, to. I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I I certainly have to be cautious about <laughs> offering a legal opinion. Right. I don't want. Yeah, and, and I don't want to get into that area no more than I want to get into to policy decisions. But um, there is a, there is a, a process available. Under Rule 75 for a review uh, of, of government action or inaction, as the case may be, and that's all I'm, I'm really trying to point out. This may provide, B may provide something that the, that the legislature, as a policy, uh, wants to adopt. So, under Rule 75, what would be the uh, standard of review for such a an action that would be brought? I mean, how would you evaluate whether the agency has? And what standard would it be applied? I'm not asking you to apply the standard, but would it be arbitrary and capricious, or would it be? You know, I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. I, I have not been involved in this kind of litigation. I would hesitate to say what the standard is. Yeah, okay. Okay. maybe That's the court or another witness can help us. But I, yeah, I'm trying to understand too. If we, you know, if the assertion is we don't need this, I, I want to really understand. What you know? What Rule 75 would, how it would truly get us to the same place? So yeah, that's, yeah, that's the question I think the committee has. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Uh, yeah. So it's separate. Can you tell us, tell us what the standards are um, for consolidation? Let's assume that under B, um, multiple parties bring lawsuits challenging, saying that you did not meet these targets of A and R. Um, I'm not asking you for, you know, to No, you're on, asking a procedural question. There is a, pro, there is a, a, a um, there are rules that allow for joinder of parties and causes of action. There has to be a commonality, but I would, you know, refer you to, to the rules. But there is a process by which, you know, if it's a common, uh, common uh, request, right. um, we would want to join parties to, to the extent that it can be, uh, if it's the same issue. Is that initiated by the court then? If they, the court sees that they have 10 cases, they, the court The, the court, court can do it, but the parties can do it. In other words, one of the parties to the action can request uh, consolidation. We sometimes see that, for instance, in environmental matters where there's an Act 250 proceeding and there's also a municipal proceeding that has some common issues. So we'll combine them for hearing before one you know, judge. Um, and so if you had multiple parties asking uh, for the same relief, there are, there are provisions for joinder of, of actions. specific questions you have, but I did um, want to address, you know, why we feel that Section 594 is necessary. Great. That'd be really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, for a few reasons, um, Rule 75 doesn't really give um, sufficient guidance, especially when you're in a situation where the state has not achieved the emission reduction requirements. Um, typically, you know, under the type of action brought under Rule 75, the question that the court is asking is, 
whether or not the agency has failed to comply with a mandatory duty, which is generally sort of a bright line, yes or no, did they do something that the statute said they had to do, or whether or not they've acted outside the scope of their authority. And so I think that without the Section B in 594, that will um, make it less clear for both plaintiffs and the state of Vermont and ANR what the obligations are um, on ANR specifically, um, how one would determine whether or not the emission reductions are met. Section B specifically points to the emissions inventory as um, guidance for whether or not the state has met you know, its reduction requirements. There could be um, a lot of different theories and how to measure greenhouse gas reduction. So that in and of itself, um, I think is important to give clarity about whether we have achieved the reduction requirements or not as a state. Um, the guidance too in this section around remedy and making it clear that the remedy is really limited to um, sending this back to you know the agency with technical expertise to do it over is important. And so I think that um, all of that guidance um, will limit litigation um, over all of those different issues. Um, the other thing I would just point out, you know, for both sub you know, section A and B is that there is a um, notice requirement. So the intent is to really give the agency an opportunity to cure um, whatever the violation is before litigation is brought. And so that's not currently um, under Rule 75. So there are provisions of both of these sections that both um, try to limit litigation um, to the extent that it's absolutely necessary to make sure that we achieve our climate re requirements. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying I'm glad someone joined me on this side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little lonely. Okay. Could be Welcome. Yeah, apologies. It was yeah, no, a little rough ride yeah. down. Uh, thank you for making it. Um, could you talk a little bit about consolidation and how that might play out uh, in those kind of cases? I, you know, I, I can't, that's something I can't address and I'd be happy to get back to you with my thoughts on that. Um, but I, you know, I expect if there are multiple plaintiffs that are alleging, you know, a violation under subsection A, you know, the court does have flexibility in terms of how they hear those cases mm -hmm. procedurally. And so, you know, there's an opportunity to th think about this, you know, the circumstances, how many plaintiffs, what the claims are, and to um, craft, you know, procedure that is most efficient for the court. And I can um, get back with you on specific thoughts, but that's my sort of general thoughts on how that would, how a court might handle that. Is that the same with subsection B as well? Mm -hmm. I, I would, it would apply to both. Okay. Um, any thoughts on um, the term substantially prevailing and some of those, some of those terms that might, you know, might or might not lead to them? Yes, and I, I mean, I agree that they are not defined um, and that there is um, some level of flexibility for a court to evaluate the circumstances of the case, um, you know, as they, in totality. And I think that for those concepts, um, like substantial cause and whether or not there's a good faith effort to take prompt action, um, those are challenging to define and are typically the kinds of things that courts are left to grapple with on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, Selena, do you want a few minutes to, should we take a recess? So, give me a few minutes to 
formulate any questions or while we have our, our witness. Um, I'm just looking at, I'm sorry, I'm really like, sorry, oh, you yeah, yeah. already covered this. I'm just looking at this proposal of new language from the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office. You probably already commented on it. I actually okay. didn't. Oh, okay. Um, That's really my question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We, yeah. we have, you know, no concerns with that language. Okay. I think that what it does is clarify um, the status quo. Um, it's consistent with the separation of powers doctrine. Um, in the status quo. So it's just making it clear that uh, that a judge will yeah. send the whole matter back to ANR and say, this isn't, you know, you didn't uh, meet the requirements of the statute, go back and try again. Mm -hmm. As opposed to um, <coughs> issuing an order that basically is a rule in that order. Right, right. Um, and so the language changes proposed by the Attorney General um, make the office make that clear. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm good. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. All right, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, so um, not, so we're not waiting for anything from ANR, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we are actually. We are okay. Um, just simply, um, there was a question uh, when ANR testified. Um, they mentioned they'd like the attorney's fees removed, and the question they were going to get back to us on was, if those attorneys, so that if those attorney's fees are removed, does ANR support the bill? If that change is made, and I haven't heard back. Um, yeah, we can take some time for discussion unless I don't know if you feel like we have to have that answer. Or I don't sure. need to have that answer. Yeah, I just think it's helpful with decision making to know what changes bring different people on board or those people. Well, and are we having committee discussion now? I mean, it felt like they weren't prepared to express a position on a number of provisions in the bill and. They haven't come back to clarify that. They their, yeah, in their previous testimony, I think there were a lot of questions. Well, not a lot, but the, I don't want to mischaracterize that. But uh, felt like there were a number of questions we asked about provisions in the bill, and and the answer was we're not prepared to respond to that. And I don't think it's any secret to them the trajectory the you know, how the bill is moving forward, and so I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to hold um, moving the bill for that answer because oh, no, I feel no. like there's... Yeah, I guess I, I don't know how much that is really our valley with as much as energy who has mm -hmm. uh, possession of this to, to make that kind of determination. I think our... Well, the attorney's fees would be. Well, our, our input is the attorney's fees work in the context of the judiciary. If they're taken out, does it still work? It, it, it does. Um, so yeah, well, but maybe uh, we certainly can hear back from. I just don't think that that. So my my reason for wanting that bit of information was that was the one. So they may not have had an answer to certain things, yeah. but the one place that they expressed concern mm -hmm. was the attorney's fees. Yeah. So I think it's a valuable piece of information to have of if if we take an action based on what they're saying, uh, well, we can't take an action, but if we make a recommendation to the committee upstairs that this is what we, we, we we're recommending, does that change the support? So. I think related to that is getting a little more information on consolidation as well. Mm -hmm. Because my impression, at least, is uh, that these will be very common questions. I mean, there's an inventory, there's a target, and they either didn't make it or not, and then you argue if it's a substantial cause or not, and if there's been prompt and effective action. I mean, there's a kind of a limited scope of what I mean, yeah, it would be litigated, but it's a limited scope as far as there wouldn't be multiple cases because they'd be answering the same question. And a court will generally, well, one of two things. It may not be consolidated, but if whatever case goes first, 
the court answers that question, and that's then binding. You know, the, the other cases are kind of bound by what that first court has decided in, in the particular case. So my point being that it's not like this is inviting dozens of cases. It seems to me still that this is opening the door for possibly three cases over the next 10 years. Uh, so, so I think that part is relevant for consideration of how much of a risk financially there is with the attorney's fees. So. Mm -hmm. And just going back to the, I mean, I'm not necessarily hearing you saying that, like, and we, so we should wait and find oh, out no, not at all. from them, but just, um, I think the same question would then apply to all the witnesses, right? Because I heard the Attorney General's office say that the attorney's fees are a really important accountability measure in this bill. I heard um, that from Conservation Law Foundation who brought, you know, related cases in the past in other jurisdictions and so um, I think we heard one witness saying that they wanted them removed but I think we heard a number of other witnesses speaking to the importance of the attorney's fees as mm -hmm. sort of the teeth of the bill really in a lot of ways at the end of the day. Um, I also don't know our time frame on this. So yeah. When are we being asked to go? <coughs> when do they want our recommendations? Yeah, I mean, I coach I see, but I, um, you know, I think our consideration is, you know, is this necessary and why? I mean, I think that's one of the questions, um, you know, and, and attorney's fees. And, um, I think also in terms of attorney's fees, um, access to justice, you know, in terms of what we speak about and mm -hmm. looking at our, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes for me it's helpful when we have bills from other committees to say, okay, what's, What's the role of our committee? And um, you know, certainly access to justice, um, which hopefully is up there somewhere. But um, is uh, I think that's I think that's important. Um, so, well, yeah. it, um, part of you know my thinking and why I asked the question earlier uh, around Martin's question of consolidation is there are a number of entities around the state uh, that fall into different jurisdictions, uh, uh, county-wide, that uh, have climate action committees. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're pretty vibrant groups, you know, around, you know, in those uh, respective areas. And, uh, I, I could see situations where their climate action statements and resolutions and some of the ones that are coming to town meeting, you know, that, that I'm aware of so far, uh, could bring them to a point of quest questioning uh, the intensity of the agency. You know, if, if a local you know, municipality is Say, well, we made a decision that we're going to go at 80 miles an hour, and um, the agency said, ah, we're only going to do 50. No, it, it, I'm making the metaphor. But, uh, you know, that might be cause, you know, especially if within their mandate and their rulemaking they said they were going to try to achieve it at a faster rate. You know? uh, and I, I could just sense some of those folks just knowing some of them, um, it could get pretty uh, this, uh, snarly or snarky, maybe. But, so the fees are would be, you know, important to know uh, for them especially. I'm sorry, the fees would be important. Uh, it, it would be important, I, I think, you know, for those individual entities because they would be hiring their own, you know, attorneys to. Other thoughts on fees? That's the only part of this bill we're dealing so, with, really, is fees right now? <laughs> no, no. Um, we're, we're dealing with this one particular section, so this cause of action, and the cause of action, and then the, and the fees. Okay, so I'm not, I'm hearing 
some support, and then I'm not hearing, not hearing anything else at this time. You're looking at a guy with a lot of questions, Go but I'm not, ahead. I'm not ready okay. to. So what are your questions? First of all, I. So I'm back on page five, right? And I'm looking down at the bottom uh, section uh, three where the, uh, greenhouse gas reduction and it's started with goals and now it's require requirements, right? Is that even attainable? And how is this being paid for? And then I'm going to go into a whole mess of other questions, and I don't think we're ready to go. I don't think I'm ready to go there yet, because I'll I'll go right from there, and then I'm going to jump back to to uh, four, page four, and and I'm going uh, right to the top of the page, line two, uh, by implementing climate mitigation, adaption, and resilience strategies. Vermont will also position its economy to benefit and thrive from the global transition. The carbon neutral, whatever that word is, and uh, not, I can't pronounce it. And national and international efforts to address the crisis, which I, I know we have, we have a, a big situation out there. But uh, balance and affordability is I have some real concerns with this. So you're in the in the findings you're talking about. What's that? You're in the findings. Is that where you're? I don't know where I am yet, Matt. Okay. I'm, I, I, I'm trying to follow along. I skimmed over this really, really quick, mm -hmm. okay? And now, uh, when we started taking a little bit more testimony this morning, uh, this morning and stuff, it's like, okay, um, uh, my radar on my in my brain has gone up more. Mm -hmm. That how this is going to affect municipalities, businesses, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, when I read. Uh, 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 the motors and stuff like that, like, uh, I don't think everything is going to be EV, EV in this state as fast as what people think. And I remember, I remember uh, it wasn't too long ago, I'm a lot older than you, but when, uh, when electricity was the evil, evil enemy in the room, so. So can I, so. I, I appreciate your concern, however, and, and it's tricky because our jurisdiction, so I think what we need to do is, so the Committee of Jurisdiction has said, this is good policy. I'm sure you have, you have questions, but in terms of, yeah, this is good policy, and so our task is, um, okay, so how does it, in terms of the judiciary and the cause of action, um, you know, does, does it make sense? which I, I don't know answering your question, but. No, so that, that's a part of this room. I need to turn back into the lawyer side, right? That I'm not. Well, well, no, I guess if you can oppose this bill in the end, but the limited question as I see it is, do we need this cause of action in here or not? Uh, what is the benefit of having this cause of action? Does it work as far as the courts? And if we didn't have the cause of action in here, it would be much more wide open. That doesn't mean that plaintiffs couldn't bring lawsuits. There's Rule 75, there's the Administrative Procedure Act, all things that Luke told us about. What that provision is trying to put in here is sidebars, you know, it, it's restrictions, guidance to actually narrow what that cause of action is. So one could oppose this bill and, and still find, all right, well, I'd like that the cause of action at least is in there limiting what litigation might result. Uh, so that, that's kind of how I look at it. I, of course, I support the bill as well, but I also support not just opening the doors for unguided litigation, and, and that's what this component does, and I think that's what we're trying to weigh in on. This is a yeah, weird, yeah. This is a weird um, place to put yourself. I had to do it a lot upstairs in appropriations because you'd get a bill and you'd look at it, you'd completely disagree with the policy side, but up there, all you were doing was looking at the money and is the money there for this bill and should should it be spent there? And so you had to almost like put blinders on to the rest of what's there and sort of focus on what the jurisdiction is. In this case, we're not even gonna ever get the bill. So you don't even have to take a vote in this committee about 
this whole bill as a whole, the, the whole thing that we're doing is just weighing into that one little section. Okay. So, so we, we might say we recommend that you keep this cause of action in, you know, mm -hmm. reasons that Martin and our witnesses mm -hmm. um, have stated, um, or you don't, or, or we keep, you know, yes, attorney fees because accountability is justice, or, or no. So mm -hmm. it is, you know, limited. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. And just to follow up on you know Matt's point uh, of jurisdiction, and and the point that you brought us back to too, is the work we did last year on our jurisdiction. Uh, because I think that any time that you know for me when I get into that cloudy area, I can refocus fairly easily by going back to the board, uh, and at least it helps to refocus because you know, it's easy to get you know to get into that <laughs> uh, odd zone right. uh, okay. um, Patrick, your hand or, or? well I mean I'll say what I'm thinking it's not really a endorsement or a criticism at this point I understand the arguments for uh, the the reasonable attorney's fees I don't it's not like a massive payout by the state, but uh, I do think there is the idea that, well, wouldn't you like to be the, the lawyer that successfully sued the state of Vermont in this case? But I don't think that's a major concern. Um, as far as whether we need the uh, course of action? Cause of action. Cause, cause of action. Um, it's not something that I'm I guess from what I'm understanding is this is directing uh, what type of legal action could be brought against in a more Kind of saying, you know, mm -hmm. Lim yeah. yeah, but yeah. limiting it from just a very rather open Absolutely. to a specifically, you can only go after us if this right. doesn't go. Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, I guess I would support. Yeah. But I don't know. Okay. So j just for clarification yes. uh, purposes, I just want it to be known out there. Mm -hmm that I don't know whether I'm for this or against this. Mm -hmm. I, I I just need to do a lot more homework on it myself. Sure. That, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I apologize for missing the first part of this, the testimony, but um, were class action lawsuits covered at all? Or is that already inherent in the rules that are highlighted in the cause of action section? Like rule seventy five. We might want to have Doug and Connor. Isn't that. it? That's a different rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that class action lawsuits are outside the scope of the cause of action section. Okay. So if, a, so if people wanted to bring a class action lawsuit, they wouldn't be able to in this, right? I think it would depend on what the class action lawsuit would be. This, that's, class action lawsuits are typically focused on um, personal injury. So the, the remedy that, um, you know, folks would be seeking would be for damages, either public health, property damage. So they're asking for a monetary compensation of injury. This cause of action section is limited to um, where the state of Vermont has failed to comply with the statute, and there are no financial penalties, there's no damages. The, the remedy is limited to remanding it back to the agency to do it over, okay. and then reimbursing um, reasonable attorney fees, um, you know, if a plaintiff prevails. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Did you want to add anything to that? I'd add one thing, I think what um, Ms. Dugan said is accurate, and class action is usually a very different context. But remember that under subsection D, it's very clear that nothing in this provision limits any cause of action. Just remind people of that. 
So you get what you get in the bill, and you keep every other option in the table. So just a question. Uh, is, is this going to be one that we will take as a vote as a committee, or will this just be something that we send up and say, this is what we think? Yeah, no, it's, it's just a recommendation, so because we don't, we don't have it, um, it's, it's not a formal vote. But if we went around the table and everybody objected to it, we a recommendation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're not in swear our recommendation. We would still recommend on a, not an actual vote, I assume, but we'd still send that recommendation up there. How many of us are for or against, right? Um, we could do it a number of ways. We could do a show of hands. We could do just census. We could do you know, a number of ways. Right. Thank you. Right. Why don't we take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back to this. Yeah, that was a continuous question.